1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, love is not easily angered. Love is not easily angered. There was a time in my life when I mustn't have had a lot of love because I was easily, easily angered. But love isn't. Anger is the most misunderstood and, by the way, misapplied emotion of all emotions that we have as human beings. A lot of people think that anger is always a sin. But can I tell you? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Sometimes anger is the most appropriate response. Actually, anger is the capacity given to you by God. Sometimes anger is an evidence of love. If I got angry because someone hurt my wife or if I got angry because someone hurt my children, that would be actually an appropriate response because if I didn't feel anger, I could probably be accused of being heartless or without care. So anger can be appropriate but we also have it or use it inappropriately. You see, the opposite of love is not anger, the opposite of love is apathy, not caring at all. That's the opposite of love. The problem is not anger in itself. The problem is whether anger is appropriately or inappropriately expressed. Managed anger is actually a good thing. It produces good marriages. It produces good leadership. It produces good churches. It produces good businesses. Knowing how to put anger in its proper place is a key to managing anger when it arises. The problem is... When it arises, we don't know how to express it. When you grew up, chances are no one ever taught you about how to manage your anger. I, I think it's probably becoming a little more common these days, but it, it didn't happen to me in school. I don't know about you. We didn't have a, like an anger management class that you could take. And, and my parents really didn't speak to me about anger. They modelled it, not always in the right way. What we typically do in anger is we go from one extreme to the other. And just because you're not like Mount Vesuvius blowing up all over the place, uh, doesn't mean that you're expressing anger inappropriately because you can also clam up and be angry at the same time. And typically those two extremes, some people clamming up and some people getting angry when they blow up about anger, they're, they're typically the two responses to anger that we have. Some people stuff it all inside and other people just let it out. Let me give you some little facts about anger that you may not know. The average woman loses her temper three times a week. The average man, six times a week. <laughs> Women often get more angry at people, while men often get more angry at things. Isn't that true? Yes, indeed. Single adults express anger twice as often as married adults. That's amazing. Men are far more physical in their anger than women. I think we all knew that one. And here's a sad one. You're more likely to express anger at home than anywhere else. So this morning, we want to look at what God has to say about how you tame your temper. How you tame your temper. Love does not get easily angered. And if you've never taken notes before... Can I encourage you, beg you, take notes today? Because what you learn today is going to be significant in terms of what you can teach your children. It'll be significant if you're an employer in what you can teach in your workplace, if you're a teacher in what you can teach in your classroom. This is important stuff, how to manage our anger. We need it today. You know, psychiatrists call the age we're living in the age of rage, the age of rage. If you just watched the news this past week, you would see it personified. So there are six things that we want to look at this morning in terms of how we manage our anger. Six things, we're going to quickly go through them. The first thing God says, if you want to tame your temper, you must resolve to manage it. Stop saying, I can't control it, and start realising that you can. Stop making excuses for your anger and realise that anger is actually a choice. Just like love. When you get angry, you're choosing to get angry. Nobody is forcing you to get angry. Nobody can make you mad. You make me so mad. Nobody can make you mad without your permission. Anger is a choice. And you choose it or you don't choose it. 
In fact, you have far more control over your anger than you want to admit. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're at home where most of anger is inappropriately used. You're at home and you're in an argument with somebody in your family and your voices are raised and you're actually yelling and you're getting excited, you're upset, you're mad and all of a sudden the phone rings. Hello? Oh yes, honey, it's for you. You see, what happened right there is you turned off anger and you turned on courtesy. Isn't that true? It's true. Anger is highly controllable. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Circle that word keeps. Keep is a choice. It's a responsibility. When I get angry, I'm choosing to get angry and I'm not blaming anyone else. When I say resolve to manage your anger, resolve means that you make a choice in advance. The time to decide to manage your anger is not when your blood pressure is going up, when the adrenaline is shooting through your system, where your nerves are on edge. That's not, and your face is flushed. That's not the time to make the choice. You've already lost the battle then. The, the time to resolve to manage your anger is well before that. To resolve your anger in advance. Before I go into this meeting, I choose not to be angry. Before I open the door to my home, as I get home from work, I choose not to be angry. I'm not going to let it get to me. How do you do this? Well, that's the second thing we find from the Bible in terms of tem taming our temper. We remember the cost. When you remember the cost of uncontrolled anger, you'll be more motivated to manage it. You're less likely to get angry if you realise that there's always a price tag to anger. The Bible is very, very specific and I could give you dozens of verses that speak about the cost of getting angry. The Bible says this in Proverbs 29, 22, a hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. You could go on and on about all kinds, couldn't you? In fact, true confession is good for the soul. In these next three verses, I'd like us to take a little survey to see if any of you could give personal testimony to this. How many of you would agree from your own life that you've found the truth of Proverbs 15, 18, where it says, hot tempers cause arguments? Anyone agree with anyone's testimony there? Hot tempers cause arguments. You can put your hand down, but not for long. How about this one? <laughs> Anger causes mistakes. Oh, yes. How about this one? People with hot tempers do foolish things. Actually, people with hot tempers say foolish things as well. You know, when I get angry, I find it hard to string three words together. It's unbelievable. Some of the most stupid things come out of my mouth. And if I'm having an argument with Deb, and let me tell you, it does occur from time to time, if I'm having an argument with Deb, I'll say stuff and I think, I'm, as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. You look stupid. The Bible says so. People with hot tempers do foolish things. In fact, people make real fools of themselves in public. Who uh, saw the man punching the tow truck at Caboolture this week? I mean, how stupid can you get? That's anger uncontrolled. Not only does he end up with, uh, at best, a sore hand, possibly a broken fist, but he's in trouble with the police as well. When you get angry, you lose 50% of your IQ. It's like something shoots a hole through your head and you do things that you would never do. Silly, stupid, embarrassing things. Proverbs 11.29 says, The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will, fi will finally have nothing worthwhile left. You always lose when you lose your temper. Write this down. I always lose when I lose my temper. I always lose when I lose my temper. What do you lose? You lose your reputation. You can lose the respect of others. You can even lose your job. You can lose, lose a sale. You can even lose your family. You can lose your health. When you, when you say, he's such a pain in the... and you name that favourite part of your anatomy, it's actually true. It's actually true. 
Because when we stuff that anger down, it causes physical ill health. When I swallow my anger, my stomach keeps score. Your body wasn't designed to handle anger. God didn't mean for you to carry rage around on the inside of you. When you carry anger constantly in you, you get sick. So we need to remember the cost whenever we're tempted to lose our temper. Here's the third thing the Bible says. Reflect before reacting. In other words, think before you speak. Put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in gear. Anger control is largely a matter of mouth control. If you can watch your words, then you're going to watch your anger. The Bible tells us it's foolish to respond impulsively to anything. There's a good word for people who like shopping. It's foolish to respond to anything impulsively. When something gets your goat, something ticks you off, something irritates you, something makes you mad, the Bible says first, resolve to manage it, then remember the cost of losing your temper and then reflect before reacting. In other words, don't respond impulsively. Let there be a little delay before you respond. Proverbs 29, 11, I said it before and I'll say it again, different version. A stupid man gives free rein to his anger. A wise man waits and lets it grow cool. What a great word. Circle the word waits. He's saying one of the greatest tools for anger management is delay. Just wait a minute. Don't write that email instantly. Boy, did I learn my lesson about writing emails. Back in the day when people used to read them, sometimes, sometimes, I know, some of you still do. That's okay. Communication changes. But I remember some of the emails that used to come to my desk. Oh, man. And I used to, I used to fire them back, you know. Salvo for salvo. It, it didn't hurt anybody but me in the end. So I learned the lesson. The first thing I did was I got Deb to read my emails before I sent them anywhere. And the second thing I did was I didn't send it straight away. And you know, often I never sent it at all. Just delaying the response. You start to think a little bit better. The longer you hold your temper, the more it improves. Have you noticed you can't put your foot in your mouth when your mouth is closed? So just wait a minute. Did you know that the average male speaks 25,000 words a day? It's the average male. The average female speaks 30,000 words a day. So when you come home and your wife comes home, she's still got 5,000 words left <laughs> that she wants to share with you, her loving husband. I was talking to a guy one time and asked, doesn't it bother you that your wife always has the last word? And he said, no, I'm just glad she gets it. I'm so glad that when she gets to it, the last word. <laughs> I can say that because Deb's in Turkey. <laughs> when she listens to the podcast, I'll hear all about it. That's right, there. Yeah. Actually, I put that in there just to test how you're going with delaying your anger, my sisters, in Christ. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Delay is a great remedy to anger. I'm not talking about unnecessary delay. I'm not talking about delaying it for a week or a month or a year. I'm, not, I'm obviously not talking about that. The Bible says actually don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, don't carry anger around from today into tomorrow. If you hold on to anger for more than 24 hours, anger turns into resentment and resentment is always wrong. Anger is not always wrong but resentment is always a sin. So I'm not saying delaying and putting it off and carrying that anger in your heart for days and weeks and months and not deal with it. No, I'm saying that if you're in an argument and you both start to get real vocal about it, it's okay to say, whoa, let's just take a five-minute break here. Maybe you need to walk into another room. Maybe you need to take a walk outside and let's come back to this when we've allowed that blood pressure just to go down a little bit, when we've allowed those nerves just to settle a little bit, when we've allowed that adrenaline to go through our system and dissipate a bit more. It's a good thing. Then come back and then you'll talk about things a little bit more calmer. So the Bible tells us to reflect before reacting and then it tells us to release my anger appropriately. And as I said, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to express anger. There's a good way and there's a sinful way 
to express anger. There's an appropriate way and an inappropriate way. But I must release my anger appropriately. Ephesians 4.26, if you become angry, don't let your anger lead you into sin, it says. In other words, there's one way to do it. You can get angry and still not sin. It's all in how you release it. And most people express their anger in ways that actually lead them further away from their goal than closer to it. So what's the best way to deal with anger? Firstly, I just need to tell you three ways that don't work. They're the world's ways of dealing with anger. You don't suppress it, you don't repress it, you don't express it, you confess it. First, you don't suppress it. What does suppression mean? It means that you've stuffed it down inside yourself. It means that you're carrying the rage on the inside. When you store it up there, when you store up anger inside, it's like taking a Coke bottle and shaking it up. Eventually, that thing is going to go blow and it's going to blow sideways where you're becoming angry at a person you were never angry at before or the person you're angry at, someone else is copying the consequences for it. That's what happens when you suppress anger. It, pushing it down doesn't work. The second thing you don't do is you don't repress it. Don't repress your anger. What's repression means? It means denying that you're angry. Don't do that either. It means saying, I'm not angry. <laughs> repression means pretending like you're not ticked off, <laughs> that you're not irritated. Some of us are great actors. That you're not mad at your husband or your wife, that you're not mad at your mum or your dad, that you're not mad at your boyfriend who's just taken advantage of you. Don't repress it. See, there's a link between repressed anger and the onset of depression. When you push anger down in you, it can cause you to become depressed. And I don't know whether you remember, but back in week one in our life groups, Rick Warren was very frank about his marriage to Kay Warren back in the early days. Do you remember that? Extremely honest. I really appreciated the honesty. And he said his marriage in those early years was like a hell on earth. In fact, if they hadn't gone to counselling, and he promoted counselling quite a bit, but if they hadn't gone to counselling, he said Saddleback would not exist, 40 days of love would not exist, his ministry would not exist, because they would have been divorced. What he didn't say was that as a result of those marital disagreements, he actually ended up in hospital with clinical depression. And he said this, he writes it, I remember the psychiatrist came in to see me in that hospital. The guy looked like Freud, and I thought, I'm in really bad trouble here. He had the beard, he was German, all he needed was the pipe. He looks at me laying there in hospital, in the hospital bed and he says, so, what are you angry about? I said, I'm not angry, I'm depressed. He said, no, you're angry. I said, I'm not angry, <laughs> I'm depressed. He said, you're angry, what are you angry about? You won't admit it, that's why you're depressed. I said, I'm not angry. And he said, Depression is frozen rage. The truth was that I was angry at Kay. I felt cheated, I felt disappointed, I felt it's not supposed to be this way. It was the beginning of the pathway back from the brink for Rick Warren. The third thing you don't do with anger is you don't express it. When you express your anger inappropriately, you're going to tend to just create more. When you express your anger in inappropriate ways, it damages relationships. And we all have our favourite ways of expressing anger, don't we? And they're all inappropriate. Some of us, we've got a black belt in sarcasm. When somebody gets us angry, our tongue is a kung fu tongue. <laughs> That's not the way to express anger. Others, others of us, oh, we're not sarcastic. We're not sharp with our words, but we are great at manipulation. Our motto is, don't get mad, get even. And others of us who like Mount Vesuvius, we just blow up, explode, exactly. The hot lava comes out and it comes out all over. Others of us, we think we're so self-righteous because we're the pouter. Poor me, Mary Martyr. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll just go and eat worms. <laughs> None of those ways are appropriate. You don't suppress it. You don't repress it. You don't express it inappropriately. 
What do you do? God says the way to deal with your anger is to confess it. You let it out to God. You admit it first to yourself, I'm angry. And then you admit it to God. God, I'm mad. You talk to God about it. You confess not just the anger, but the cause of the anger. God, I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm scared. I feel insecure. I feel this is out of control. You admit the cause behind the anger. You confess it. And that's how you effectively deal with anger. And the next step is the key to permanent long-term change. These others we've dealt with are for the moment. They're in that time when you're about to get angry or when you are angry. But if you're serious about saying, I don't want to be an angry person, I don't want to be a mute or a martyr or a maniac, I don't want to clam up and I don't want to blow up, I want to learn the proper ways, then you must repattern your mind. Don't copy the behaviour and customs of the world, the Bible says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Just circle that, changing the way you think. This is the key to learning a new way to handle anger, change the way you think. When you act in angry ways, it's because you feel angry, and when you feel angry, it's because you're choosing to think angry thoughts. The way I think affects the way I feel, and every time I feel something, it's because I'm thinking something. Every emotion you feel has a thought behind it. And when you think this, you're going to feel that. If I feel depressed, it's because I'm thinking depressed thoughts. The way I think determines the way I feel, and the way I feel determines the way I act. So if I want to change the way I act, and let's say I have a tendency to be abusive, to fly off the handle, to act out and show physical violence, you don't focus on the behaviour, you start by going back, not even to the way you feel, you start by changing what you think. If you change that thought, that mental process, it's going to change your feeling and in turn it's going to change your behaviour. The Bible says, be changed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what God says. He's the one who can change those thought patterns in your mind. To break the habit of anger, you have to get some mental reconditioning. Lastly, rely on God's help. This isn't going to be solved by reading a self-help book or a magazine or taking a seminar. The real secret is God's power to change you on the inside. It's remarkable what God can do in a person's heart. It is absolutely remarkable. Complete change, complete transformation. Sometimes all at once, miraculously, all at once. But often as a process over time, He will change your heart. Romans 15, 5, patience and encouragement come from God. Not a pill, not a seminar, not a conference. I'm not speaking about medications here, not at all. Believe me, I've spoken to many people. Medications are appropriate and needed. But God can change our hearts. God can change our hearts. I pray God will help you to agree with each other. In other words, so you're not fighting all the time. Agree with each other the way Christ Jesus wants. Your relationship and your closeness to Jesus Christ will determine the amount of patience you have in your life. Can I tell you a personal testimony? I've found that the closer I'm walking with Jesus Christ, the more I'm in his word, the more I'm praying, the more I allow him to have priority in my day and in my life when other circumstances arise, the more patient a person I've become over time. I used to get angry all the time, like all the time, always on edge always feeling insecure on the inside. But just a personal devotional habit changed changed me because God does work on the inside, which begins to flow out to the outside. He changes our thinking, which changes our feeling, which changes our acting. Your relationship and your closeness to Jesus Christ will determine the amount of patience you have in your life. If you're close to Jesus Christ, you're going to have a lot of patience in your life. 
If you're kind of wishy-washy in your relationship with Christ, you're going to sometimes be patient and sometimes not. If you're kind of on the fringe in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to have problems and anger all through your life. How does God help me with my bad habit of anger? I'll tell you how he does it. He goes straight to the heart of the problem because the problem is in your heart. It starts in the heart. It doesn't start in your behaviour. It doesn't start in your background. It doesn't start with your attitudes and your feelings and your emotions. It starts in the heart. The Bible says this, whatever is in your heart determines what you will say. You see, the problem is not my tongue, it's my heart. My mouth just betrays what's inside my heart. Your mouth just reveals what's there. If it wasn't in your heart, it wouldn't be coming out of your mouth. The problem is not your mouth, the problem is our hearts. See, if I've got bad water in a rainwater tank, painting the pump isn't going to fix the water. I'll still have bad water in the tank. My mouth just betrays what's inside me. You find somebody with a harsh tongue, a cutting tongue, it reveals an angry heart. You find somebody with a negative tongue, you know that they've got a fearful heart. You find somebody with a boasting tongue, you know that they've got an insecure heart. You find somebody with a judgmental tongue, they're always judging everybody, you know that they've got a guilty heart. In fact, it helps you to help people by understanding that what's coming out of their mouth is actually not the issue, it's what's in their heart. And if you can connect the two, you can really help them. You can really help them. Often we're put off by people by what's coming out of their mouth, but if we can see what's behind it, then we can really do it, make a difference in their lives. You find somebody with a critical tongue, they're always nagging and being critical, they've got a bitter heart. You find somebody with a filthy tongue, you know that they've got an impure heart. On the other hand, if you find somebody is always encouraging, they're always encouraging, they have a happy heart. You know what's on the inside of them. If they're always speaking in a gentle way, you know that they've got a loving heart. If they're always being loving and controlling in their words, or controlled rather in their words, you know that they've got a heart at peace, a peaceful heart. Can I just ask the musicians to return? You see, what we need is a heart transplant. We need a new heart. David, in Psalm 51, David, a believer, David, a man after God's own heart, David, a man of faith and extreme courage, David, who was the one every subsequent king was compared to, he wrote this, create in me a clean heart, O God. And that's what we need to say today, God, Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a peaceful heart. Create in me a loving heart. Create in me whatever it is that you need. God, create that in me. And then press into Jesus. Worship him with all your heart, even when you don't feel like it. Place him as the priority in your life, that he gets first place. Whether it's the first hour of the morning or whether he's the interruption to your day, you're going to give him that time that he needs. He will change your heart. He will create a new new heart. Jesus can replace a hurting heart and all that pain with a sense of his love. Maybe you've been beaten and abused, rejected, unloved. God says, I care about your pain. It matters to me. I will help you in the healing. Maybe you've got a frustrated heart. God can fill it with his peace. Maybe you've got an insecure heart. It seems out of control. He can fill it with his confidence. If your heart is crying out inside, it's because you haven't ever received or fully received the warmth and security of Jesus Christ. Why don't we just bow our heads where we are right now? Lord Jesus, it's so good to be in your presence. It's, it's good to be with my brothers and sisters. It's good to be with my friends here this morning. But it's so much better 
to be with you and with them together. Because right now, you're like a doctor. Right now, it's like you've got the surgeon's knife. And right now, you want to work in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come right now and begin to do a work or complete a little bit more that work that you've already begun in our hearts to change us. Lord God, some of those things that we just heard this morning, that sarcasm, that judgmentalism, that complaining, that gossiping, that bitterness, Lord, they're some of the things that come out of my mouth. And I've heard this morning that your word says that that my mouth isn't the problem, my heart's the problem. And it's good that I'm here with you because you're the one that can change that. Not just that you're here when we're at church. You said that you'd never leave me nor forsake me. God, I pray that you would help us. Help me, Lord God, prioritize you. Put you really at first place in my life. Let you into the rooms of my heart that I've never allowed you access to. Holy Spirit, would you come and enter that room of insecurity? Enter that room where I've found it easier to blame others rather than face myself and what I'm like. I just, want to, I just want to open the door to that room because I, I need you to change it. I, I allow you to enter that room where I've been hurt, where I've been rejected, where things that were said over me when I was young, I'm still carrying in my life. Enter that room in my heart. Holy Spirit, just do a spring clean, Lord God, into some of those rooms where I've allowed influences to come in which are not of you. I, I thank you, God, that I've been reminded even at the beginning of this service how much you love me that you don't turn away because of what you see in my heart you you reach out and you call me to open the door so that you can come in Lord I thank you for the work that you're doing making us more loving loving you and loving others. For some of us, it's a beginning work where the, what we need to know is how much you love us before we can love others or before we can return love to you. Do that this morning. Do it this week. Do it in our life groups. Do it in our devotional time. Do it in every situation where we can just sense that you're, you're there. Change us, grow us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.